，这一场应该是发表的艺术家跟那个艺术史学家呃最多的一个场次。我们总共有八哎六七个七个啊研讨研讨会的一个一个啊、呃、主题的发表啊。那呃。当初我接到这个题目的时候，呃，主主办单位要我写一段很很短的、很短的介绍，有关于容器啊。那当初我拿到的资料里面，啊、呃，我稍微看了一下，有只有包括美国啦、哈、台湾还有韩国的啊、呃、发表人。那后来有陆续增加啊，还有南非的、有英国的、还有中国的啊、呃、发表人。那啊。呃原先我不是我不是主持这一个题目，我是主持第一个那个建筑啊，建筑跟陶艺的关系的那个题目。那后来我我换了这个题目以后，我觉得啊、呃，我比较比较好像跟跟我的陶瓷的本行比较有相关啊，所以我也蛮高兴可以当这一场的主持这样子啊。那我对于容器这样一个。命题啊，对于 vessel 这个题材的认知啊，应该追溯到当年我一九八九年到 Rochester 到 RIT 念书的时候啊，我的老师我知道老师 Rick Hirsch 是就是美国啊新生一代的做容器的指导老师啊，那啊我对容器的认知也是从我的指导老师那边开始啊，那。对于一个啊、呃、用陶瓷媒材来做创作的艺术工作者来说啊、呃，尤其是从台湾刚走出去啊、呃、到国外求学的的年轻人来讲啊，他对我来讲是一个很很新的一个陌生的领域啊。那经过受到 Peter v o r k e s 的影响之后，对于容器他们产生了一个新的啊、呃、创作上的运动啊。那后来我又到了澳洲墨尔本去啊、呃、念另外一个学位的时候，那我发现呃，其实在，在在澳洲啊、呃，他们并没有这样的一个容器的运动啊、呃，所以我才发现说啊、呃，每一个地区哦、呃，他们对于 vessel 这样一个概念的诠释其实非常的不同哦，那。今天我们有来自几个不同的世界上各个角落啊，几个不同国家的艺术家跟跟研究者啊。那经过他们的诠释，那我们可以从不同文化的角度，跟从不同陶瓷艺术环境的角度切入啊，让我们能够对于这一个命题，可以有更深的一个认识啊。那因为今天啊。呃发表的人比较多，所以我的介绍就到这边。接着我啊、呃，邀请第一位发来发表的艺术家。Good morning, everyone. Good morning.、Um, I still have a bit of a cold, so every now and then my voice will probably disappear. So, what I'm bringing you today is a bit of unique cultural history from my country, South Africa, and specifically about Rourke's Drift. We have to go back into history to put it into context. What happened at Rourke's Drift in South Africa? You will be well aware that from the middle of the 19th, late 1950s to the 1980s, South Africa was a country with、uh, under a state of political oppression, and apartheid ruled supreme. In that era, it only mattered if you were white. When you got all of the benefits of society, if you were black, Indian, or coloured, you were marginalised, and whatever was of interest to you was relegated to complete insignificance. In that era, a lot of foreign support came to South Africa, to the marginalised people. One of those parties was the Evangelical Lutheran Church. Um, from the Scandinavian countries, and in the province of KwaZulu Natal, the church, the mission, started to create a support group, 
a self-help group, and that was in the form of a craft and art center. Now, the local people are from the Zulu and the Sutu cultures, and what the church did was to tap into the local traditions of craft making to develop that, but using Western techniques and Western teachers, which they supplied to the local people. And what evolved was a culture of craft making, and especially ceramics, where we had local traditions, but adapted for Western taste. And that is the background to it all. So in 1968, the ceramic studio workshop at Rorkschrift was established. And within two years, it produced work of such high quality that it was actually purchased by the Durban Art Gallery, Durban being the, the capital city of the province. That was very, very significant because it was the first time that contemporary black South African art or craft was purchased for a virtually exclusive white museum. And the, the moment that that happened, everybody woke up to the fact that we ha had in our midst a very unique expression of culture in a traditional form. So, so that is the missionary church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, or we call it ELC, Art and Craft Center at Rorkstrift, which was established in 1970. Within two years, the Durban Art Gallery purchased Rorkstrift's pottery for its uh, public collection. What followed then was international exposure in uh, South Africa, in Sweden, and in America. At the same time, the Craft Center at Rorkstrift also produced weaving and prints um, and also some sewing, but the pottery, the weaving, and the prints became internationally known. Um, and collectors and galleries and museums were competing to get hold of the products of Rourke's Drift. Um, by the end of the 1980s and towards the mid of the 1990s, the political situation in South Africa changed dramatically. We had a transition from apartheid into democracy. And when the first democratic government was elected, 94, everything changed. Suddenly, it was no longer fashion to support marginalized indigenous group. The, the attention shifted completely. And we were stuck in a situation where the colonialists have gone, the post-colonialists have gone, and now we are stuck in a post-colonial post situation where everything came to a standstill that was funded previously from abroad. It brings us to a situation where we have to consider what is the legacy of Rourke's Drift. Is Rourke's Drift, now that it is no longer as active and as much sought after as in the past, do we now view it as a relic of the post-colonial era? Or can we still see in Rourke's Drift that it has a valuable legacy um, in the debate about craft and how craft created identity and meaning for the people involved in the craft. Back to the history of Rourke's Drift, because that will create better understanding of the value of the legacy of that ceramic workshop. What is interesting is that from its very beginning, remember that we had two cultures that we tapped into, the Zulu and the, uh, and the Sutu, that there was a gender division in the workshop. In other words, the women were taught one way of creating ceramics, the men another way of ceramics. The women come from, a cult, from cultures where uh, pot building is traditional. Um, mostly then from the Sutu culture, but they were living amongst Zulu people. So they were practicing uh, the craft of hand building pots. Um, and the pots that they would build would be for brewing of beer, called merifi, uh, for cooking, that's a pizza, 
and other dom domestic pots, and in particular for the, uh, the pots of the low alcohol beer, the Uchwala. The Sutra tradition is a coiling technique with te uh, decorations in red terracotta colors with a very thick lip, which is quite distinctive. In a Zulu uh, tradition, the pots are coiled and decorated in brown and black colors, which are then burnished, polished, um, at the lever heart stage, then fired a second time, and the result is a very glossy um, black surface, and which is then afterwards uh, polished again with cow fat or with wax. In both cultures, they make use of traditional decorative elements, whether it's cut into the surface or added onto the surface. And these could be raised bumps, which you will see. You can see the effect of raised bumps. Um, and in this instance, it's applied to the wings, or else it would be on the surface of the pots. It's called amasumpa, or pinched surfaces, or geometric designs, or hatchings, or um, zigzags and triangles. And quite often, the designs of the surface designs of the pots were also the designs used in the weaving of traditional Zulu mats. Uh, the men, on the other hand, were taught to throw forms on the wheel. And the forms were very Western. As you can see, this is a typical Western bottle. Um, and sometimes they were uh, added handles or spouts, which are very Western uh, features of ceramics. The illustrative work was completely different to that of the women. The men were very influenced by the uh, graphic uh, studio at Rolksdrift, and many of the elements and of the techniques were translated from the graphic side onto the ceramic side, so that we have more linear and figurative uh, illustrations of the men, uh, by the men on the pottery, always in to complement the form. So we would have decorations in a cartouche, or in linear bands across the form. Uh, two of the uh, men who achieved fame in the ceramic studio, in fact, started off in the graphic side, and their experiences they transfer to ceramic. So, the men in the illustrative work delivered a social commentary on their life, their environment, um, on politics, on the economy. Um, the women uh, did not make such pronounced social statements at all. Because of the, the form and the illustrative work of the men's work, the men's work became much more um, commanding uh, and collectible amongst Westerners. Uh, the Westerners could associate more easily with the men's work than with the women's work. So. What the mission, the, the church, set out to achieve, and this is really important for the context of the discussion, is what did they want to achieve? Yes, they wanted to create self-help groups so that the people could earn money to support themselves. So they said, we want to achieve that because um, we can make a contribution. The result has been, in, in various descriptions, what happened in the end, is that it became a composite, globalized identity, said the one uh, expert. Someone else called it African tradition and Scandinavian enlightenment in, um, interwoven. Um, or the conflation of Scandinavian graphic design and indigenous sources. Um, the, these were the various ways in which Westerners tried to rationalize the effect of the Western contribution to traditional craft development. The commentary that I prefer to follow is by a South African academic, uh, Freddy Motsamai, who said, what we are seeing here is an example of an invented tradition, a new form of African expression intended mainly for Western patrons. Whatever Rogsdorf produced 
were bought by Westerners, not by black South Africans. At the same time, we acknowledge that the Western support group did not demand of the potters at Rogstrift to create pots in this way or that way. They encouraged the men and the women to keep as much as they could of their local tradition. Um, and hence we see something like this. The lower part of this piece of a woman's uh, built pot is what we call a hen on nest. And the original design is Victorian and it would have been a lidded post, uh, pot uh, with the lid being the hen and the lower part of a pot being the nest. But in Rourke's Drift interpretation, this became a sculptural item and they simply added on and on and on and built it. So this is a very good example of how a very British piece of ceramic was translated in a, a Rourke's Drift idiom. We call this um, augmentation, um, meaning that we added on. We, we didn't destroy um, something or recreate something. They merely embellished what they were familiar with. Something else that was very distinctive about Rorkstrift was that the potters started identifying themselves. In, traditionally, it was so that Westerners appreciated African art, broadly speaking African art, because it was anonymous. The, the individual artist did not matter. It did not matter who made it. Rather, it was more important from which region did it come or which tribe it came, but the, indiv the individual artist was not very important. So in, at Rookstrift, we suddenly have the identification of the potter. And they would write their names, the kiln number, and the date. And suddenly, this helped to elevate Rookstrift as an art craft form. We have to go just go back to the point of, did we, by, in, by Western influence, did we engineer did we deliberately alter a tradition and a culture? And that is a question that will be debated for many decades to come. The, there's one African opinion that was voiced by uh, Joseph Nyasani, who is very bitter about Western influence, and he said that the cultural emasculation of colonialism has left black Africa crucified on the cross of black mailers, arm twisters, and enslaving technologies. And that's a rather bitter and one-sided view. What we are saying is, is that Western influence and post-colonial support did create a new tradition of ceramics at Rourke's Drift. And we want to celebrate that. It's dying out now. The, the money is gone, the support is gone, the, the buyers have gone. The, the, what they are producing is now very much tourism-like. So do we sit back and we cry about something that has gone lost? And my answer is no. We cannot step in and recreate Rorkstrift. It would be false. Because Rorkstrift belonged to a specific era and a specific group of people at a specific time in the history of South Africa. To try and keep it alive would be quite plastic. We would be reinventing. We cannot reinvent the past, but we can imagine what could possibly come out of the new generation of Rorkstrift ceramics. I think I have one more picture to finish up with. Just for interesting sake, that is one of the women hand coilers who is still active there after 40 years. And that is Gordon Mbata, one of the men, still active after 40 years. This is what contemporary Rorkstrift ceramics look like, completely different. We can still see the traditional elements, but the form and the color and the technique, everything has changed. Now, do we want to keep this alive or do we want to keep the past alive? This is contemporary uh, work by um, one of the potters, a lot of uh, scraffito work, 
very basic colors, nothing at all as in the past. But the traditional elements are still there. We still see the narrative. That is Linda Musa Mbasa. He is still very active. And you can see him with his engraving work. That is a classical piece of um, Rockstrift ceramics. Um, it's a fish form. And you can see all the elements of the traditional culture. The work being produced now is nothing of this kind at all. This belongs to the past. That's why I say the past cannot be reinvented, but we can imagine what the future will produce. Thank you. Uh, um, I, I just need to compose myself because uh, it, uh, I'm not used to a lot of people are talking a more a hands-on type of a person. Um, I would like to thank you, um, Wendy, yes, for affording me the opportunity of being here and uh, realizing my future, perhaps, in the ceramics and play and play more. And I would also like to thank uh, the Inga Museum and the Inga community for the support that they've had uh, of me being here in the, in the past month and couple of days, and the community for putting up with this strange looking creature in <laughs> the community. But uh, yeah, so I will just give you a little bit of a background, um, very briefly, of who I am and where I come from. Uh, I come from South Africa. Cape Town, and South Africa is a country, for those who don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm saying this because if you tell someone you are from South Africa, they say, what country? You know. So I just have to clarify that because there are people who still don't know South Africa is a country. And South Africa being a country, uh, that's Africa is huge. A lot of times I've traveled and I say I'm from South Africa. And then someone will say, oh, I know a friend from Nigeria, which is somewhere there. And <laughs> perhaps, you know, so it's, it's, I think it's important for me to highlight this. And then that is South Africa, which is this part. And I come from this uh, province, which is the Eastern Cape. And I come from somewhere here in this as a village. I didn't have any art subjects, so we're not going to get to that. But somehow I found myself uh, very um, sort of, I get bored in the class when I was taught. And instead of then listening after 30 minutes, then I'll start doodling and I would get punished for that. So anyways, so when I finished going to school there, oh wait, let's go back. So when I done my schooling there and so on and so on, I then went to Cape Town and I, I and at this time, I was, my doodles were actually getting very excited and my family supported me. They were like, wow, you're the best artist, but they didn't know anything about what is it that I could do, but they either I would need to be a teacher or a lawyer or something, but that. So, but anyways, they, they supported this creativeness because my father somehow, which is, that is my father, still alive, is 89. That's my eldest brother, that's me. This is my youngest son. And this was the first time he arrived and he seen him from Cape Town. And this is a crawl. And my father is, actually now he can't walk. So what you do is, you bring the child into the crawl, which where we believe the ancestors are, and where we praise the ancestors, so to introduce him to the family or to the ancestors, to welcome him. So we are a very a proud family. So as the fathers are very proud of their sons. So I come from such a very strong family. But anyway, I thought I should show you that. And so with all of that said, also with all these Thanksgiving, being sort of praising ancestors and 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 uh, respecting elders, we do a lot of ceremonies. <coughs> and from where I come from, I do not have a reference of any ceramic pot, unfortunately. But uh, 
when uh, my father told me that he used to, or his father, in fact, he used to drink out of a ceramic vessel. Now, we, that what they use, they use a metal, uh, like a metal bucket, which is rusty. This, you see here, it's one of my recent pieces I've, I've done. And then this is a traditional, be traditional beer that the men will be drinking. And this will be passed on from the eldest man to the youngest and back and forth. So that's so. What happened is that here I decided to bring my father a a gift to say that that this is what I do when I'm in Cape Town. I play with clay still, and he's very proud of that. But then he find that wow, this was amazing, and I didn't. It was for me. It was just a gift. But he decided to call the whole family to say. At, at so and so time in this date, everyone has to be here because he has to show off. But also, what I didn't or he didn't realize is that the whole community came, which that's 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 usually the case. And then my mother brewed mkomboti, which is a traditional beer, and somehow this vessel was given a name by the community, and the name is called Isishwele, which is the spirits, good spirits that have passed by. And one of the reasons is because. Uh, what when I do what I do, I I visualize things, I dream them, I see them right in front of me realistically. Then I'll put them on paper. So somehow they felt that somehow this is a calling that I have, and so I'm possible be the appointed one to somehow bring back, not necessarily, but somehow to bring a little bit of a tradition, you know, in 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 a modern way somehow, but even within the family and perhaps the community. So. For me, that was very an emotional moment because it was just a gift, and everyone made a big woo about it. But I was very honored. So, anyways, now I I then went to Cape Town, and I went to an a, a, an art an art college. I did, um, and it was my first time ever, sort of, you know that art is not only just about drawing, because that's what I thought. Because uh, at and I realized that almost everything around us, if you know, you have to start with the drawing somehow to design, and I was very excited. So I graduated in 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 art and design, and majored in ceramics and graphic design. But this was very basic, and um, and and drawing. And then at a later stage, I worked in a ceramic studio, and then I went to. I got a scholarship to go and study at Port Elizabeth Technicon, which I made. I, I studied ceramic design, and when I finished, then I moved back to Cape Town and opened a studio, and I worked at a ceramic studio there. So basically, my I would now start to telling you about my inspiration and where I come from and everything. Um, I looked somehow because of the very strong tradition that I have. I was raised by. I looked at the traditional outfits, and this is nothing that really I I I, I deliberately sort of um, sort of consciously looking at looked at. I just worked and made these vessels because I was very much trained as a vessel uh, maker, functional beer pot, plates, cups, and so on and so on. But um, the patterns were very, <coughs> excuse me, in the early stage were very graphic. They were representing uh, where I come from, the landscape that you, I've just shown you there. The very bright colors leave sort of like very floral and everything. But at the later stage, I started discovering myself and looking at the African artifacts, which is the storage, the Nguni storage vessels, and the beer pot, the milk pail, and so on and so on. And then the patterns that you see here and the colors, that with a traditional um, outfit by the Kosa women when they're dancing, when they have a ceremony. That's a sheepskin, and it will be dyed with a, either a, 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 a bark of a tree or, or the red soil that will be in the area, and there's a, a glass beads. And then they will put this, the same color, red ochre clay on the body to protect from the heat also, but also it was part of, you know, the sort of adorning themselves and everything and then the the, the black sort of very heavy looking like duke or uh, cloth and then and so on and so on somehow these forms were in very much inspired by the the the, the figures of the women and by also also the the patterns that you see here is basically from all these patterns from these 
sort of traditional outfits. And then looking at the roots, it's for me it's important to look to look back and back where I come from because I think I find home very secure, very safe, very true to myself in that sense. But also the the forms because we use the roots. My grandfather you, when I went up the mountain with him, he would teach me what roots to eat, what roots not to eat, what can you use for the medicines, and somehow I looked at that. And I come from a culture of uh, where we practice these traditional rituals, which is something that is uh, practiced widely in Africa and not a lot now, and my father does certain, does that practice. So I somehow found myself using this uh, technique of cutting into my clay and using it as a surface to create these patterns, but and then this is how I used it. These are the typical verses that uh, I uh, I'm, I'm currently doing, and and I found myself use, using music and creating these rhythmic kind of like patterns uh, to uh, create these forms and so on and so on, and. Because I draw a lot, so f this the way that I uh, I use drawing first and then start making, collecting a lot of found objects and constructing and so on. And now I'm in Cape Town, and um, this is what I've been exposed in the last 12 years, and this is what comes of it. These are ceramic interlocking blocks that look like the city and the colors that I use and the patterns and the forms influenced by that. And I started using the, doing the illustrations directly on the vessel that I'm doing and found objects to create these patterns that are inspired by these things that I collect within the harbor. Funny enough, my father for 25 years worked in these docks and somehow now this comes out. And that's that. And and this is here now. So the illustration that I've been doing, I decided to I sort of became more interested in the form and how the angles changes and everything. I started illustrating this form and this is when I'm here now, I started to play and not wanting to make vessels, just to make objects that are influenced by my surrounding, by the things that I see every day. When I was here, I took a walk and ran, sat under the tree or the next to the riverside and I drew realistically and design. Uh, what's this? And for me, it's very important to, uh, I found very important to to respect the people of the community and also because they, they welcomed me, Mr. Chen, he welcomed me on my first day and he invited me to his space where he was demonstrating. Then eventually we have a, a, con a conversation without having to talk, but making. It was very important for me to both of us when I asked him to 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 make the pieces that he can uh, he must sign because this we both brought life to this this in the exchange and that's me making and illustrating this is the process I've done uh, coiling and building unfortunately this video doesn't play but because I I use music a lot so I was almost dancing to the vessels when I'm making. And that's glaze ink, and that's um, me uh, firing and saying goodbye to the pieces, saying praising to the king gods, and uh, Ken, very very helpful, and thank you to Francois for that piece as well, and that's me and the master, exciting about what's going to come out of the kill, and me uh, as. You're looking at the piece. This is what I came out with, as you can see. And thank you. Well, good morning, and thank you to the museum, to Wendy Garst for bringing me, and thank you so much for representing so strongly um, Zulu contemporary ceramic tradition um, here at the Biennale. I'd also like to thank the Craft Council, or, or sorry, <laughs> the Center for Craft, Creativity, and Design out of Asheville, North Carolina, um, which is one of the many institutions that has supported my research um, and that's supporting my contemporary research right now. Um, my talk today, 
gestures, symbolism, and display, a transforming culture of Zulu beer vessels. We'll look at the history of Zulu ceramics, but also look at the boundaries of what Zulu ceramics is today. Now, the image that you see here is uh, one of the first records of royal Zulu ceramics. Um, Zulu ceramics were not always what they are today. It was only in the early 1800s that um, blackened beer vessels began to typify Zulu ceramics. Um, prior to that, there were red pots, kind of like what we've heard about already, um, and woven vessels for presenting beer. Um, and in the 1950s, what Zulu ceramics are became very limited. Um, this image was rep reproduced again and again um, during the apartheid era. And this specific type of Amasumpa bump design of an applied panel that was carved became sort of an icon of Zulu identity. And it was very important for um, apartheid era uh, school officials and uh, politicians to carve off one group from another. So Zulu people produced this. But unfortunately, it narrowed the range of what Zulu ceramics could be. Now, what is a Zulu pot at its base? It is a container for Zulu beer. We've heard about the low, uh, low alcohol beer, um, Uchwala. And here is a man respectfully showing you how you can drink Zulu beer. You're low to the ground. You hold both hands. You sit in a group of peers. And I've ta just taken my shoes off because I'm going to show you how that beer will be presented. Now, I kept my arms close to my body. I didn't look at anyone in the eye because I'm deferring. Um, I presented the beer pot on the ground, which is where a Zulu beer pot is normally seen. And then I clapped in thanks and praise. 